To all you sports fans, did you know you can stream this podcast on Spotify right now? It's easy. Open the app on your mobile device or desktop, click on the Browse channel, then click on the Podcast section. You can also stream on your smart speaker. Now, it's that much easier for you to stay up to date on all the latest and greatest in all things sports, thanks to Spotify. This Clinton, Bomani, Bob, our Final Four, yeah. on the Final Four. Also, Steph's MCL and Odell Beckham's threat to not Get step foot on a field without a new contract. Boom! Oh. I feel like I have to apologize to Bob for showing that. I'm sorry, Bob. It's well done. It's Around the Horn, the show of competitive better. Here's Tony Rielli. Legit question, National Panel. You can just yell out your answer. Between Loyola, Chicago, UMBC, Virginia, all the other upsets in a game like last night, Kansas Duke. Could this possibly be the greatest tournament ever? Nope. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's strong. Hey, good. Not quite. I'll take that as a maybe. Kansas Still Duke in. and whether the officiating tip the scales. Lock charge call on Carter Jr. What everybody's pointing to. Whether Malik Newman had the half of the tournament. Whether maybe the drama would have been better if that shot had fallen from Grayson Allen. And whether the better team won. Tim Kalashar, are you going to start us off? Any of those questions in any order go well let's start with the, the charge block because that's what a lot of folks are talking about and it was the fifth foul and i think if we wanted to have four hour basketball games and have referees uh, look at everything in slow motion like we get to they would say that should have been a charge and, and they got the call uh wrong but it's close enough and when you got four fouls i don't think you can be taking those chances we saw the other night with kansas state xavier sneed just got back into the game with four fouls and he swats at the ball and, you know, maybe he didn't foul the guy or not, but he gave the ref a chance to call it. Okay. And mm-hmm. you take that risk. Uh, but beyond that, no, I don't think it would be a better game if Grayson Allen's shot went in. I thought Kansas played great. I thought Kansas, despite being undersized, handled the Duke big men very well. They hit the big shots. And Malik Newman was the best player on the floor yesterday, as he's been for Kansas for about two weeks now. So I thought, in that case, the best team won. Glenn Yates, did the better team win? I think so. I think when a guy like Malik Newman ends up scoring not just so many points, 26 between the second half and overtime, but he scored all of his team's points in overtime, you've got to believe that the guy that was supposed to do it did it. Grayson Allen finished, what, 3 for 13 in his last game at Duke, second best player on that team. I overall was satisfied with this game, but when it comes to officiating overall, it's college basketball. You've got to expect that you're going to get bad calls. That's part of the deal. The players aren't as good. The refs aren't as good. So in big-time moments, you're Mm. going to have 10 situations in which guys blow calls, and I think they did in this situation, but it did not affect the overall likability of this game for me. Bomani Jones, your takeaway? Uh, fans of 13 ACC schools laughed at the idea that Duke got the business end of a block charge call. They have to acknowledge <laughs> that part of the irony that was there from it. Now, as for this game, look, Duke was the more talented team. There's no question about that. Kansas was the more experienced team, and that led to two interesting things. One is kind of big picture, which is that Duke has changed the recruiting model and getting more talented players, but the results aren't necessarily improving by the time tournaments are over. And then the other part that you wind up with is Duke went to a zone this year in part just because they could not play man-to-man defense. You normally don't want to have to go to a zone when you've got the more talented players. It's like putting a governor on what you have with the guys. Bill Self cooked up a game plan that shut down Marvin Bagley. There was no game plan to cook up to stop Malik Newman because their game plan was playing that cowardly zone where an experienced team is going to move the ball and find the shots. Kansas was that experienced team that moved the ball, that found the shots. Zone is for cowards and they're going home. Okay. And Bob Ryan, how about you? Your takeaway. Yeah, Wendell Carter did what he's been taught to do probably since third grade, and I don't like the rule. I don't like standing there like a statue being rewarded, but he took a charge and did not get the call, and he was unfairly, he was not properly rewarded. As far as the game's concerned, if it had ended in regulation, uh, then uh, it would have been still a great game, but we were treated to something, a bonus, a cherry on the Sunday, Malik Newman in the overtime, and don't forget Mahalik's big shot to get them there. I, so I don't know if the best team won, I don't care, the appropriate team won, the team that made the big play, the biggest of the big plays when it mattered was Kansas. And one more thing, you can't complain when you are out rebounded by the frightful margin that Carolina was. So I have no problem. The team that should have won the game won the game. You said Carolina. You, of course, mean Duke there. I mean Uh, the Duke, 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 Duke. Last Duke game for Grayson Allen. Marvin Bagley, everybody thinks he's going pro. Uh, You were talking about the talent on this team there. How how do you view both, though, Bomani? 
Well, I think with Bagley, the question people are going to ask is about defense because he's a big reason why they had to wind up going to the zone. I don't know where Grayson Allen's going to go. I'd expect late first round, early second round. But, I mean, the peak for him was that championship game in 2015. He had some good seasons beyond that. But what we're dealing with is a very good college player. I don't know what else we're dealing with beyond that. Mm -hmm. Tim Kalshaw? Yeah, if you're Grayson Allen and you stay four years, the problem is you were better as a freshman or as good as a freshman. As Bo said, your highlight was the championship game three years ago than you are. And, you know, he resurrected his, you know, he, he got rid of all the tripping and that stuff. So he got that out of his game, but he didn't become a great player. Uh, Bagley, you know, he's going to be in the, picked very high and he's going to be a project uh, because it's getting harder and harder to be a big man in the NBA because you got to guard the three-point line and do all kinds of things that Marvin Bagley can't do right now. Bob Ryan. I feel sorry for Bag. I worry about Bagley because he's going to get into a league and find out that against it's against the the concept, the rules to play in the low post and to and to work the baseline <laughs> and do your Kevin McHale up and under move and do all the things to make Bagley Bagley. He may have to go find a country where they allow those things because the NBA <laughs> doesn't want they want seven footers <laughs> to go shoot three point shots. Okay, no, yeah. he's really going to be in trouble. I don't I don't know what's going to happen to him. You don't really mean he's going to have to find uh, another country to play professional <laughs> ball, and you just mean that the NBA he has evolved to. to a way that is not your liking. The skilled big um, man who plays in the low blocks. All right, so maybe my tongue was a little bit in the cheek, okay? <laughs> uh, but you get my point, don't you? Uh, no, he's going to be a wonderful you're pro. You're subtle as a sledgehammer, Bob Ryan. We're going to move on. We've gone too far into the show without talking Loyola Chicago. So I've said it before. It takes two miracles to become a saint. Sister Jean is at four right now. She's two saints. Loyal to Chicago after winning the first three games by four Saturday night, rolling Kansas State by 16. And then there's this. From a television standpoint, you really root for the big team. That's CBS Sports Chairman Sean McManus on Mad Dog Sports Radio. And good afternoon, everybody. How you doing today? Christopher Russo. Bomani, how do you hear that? And how do you view this entire run by Loyola Chicago, one of the best Cinderella's of all time, would you say? All right, well, one of the first things is I love the idea that the man most invested in the rating success of this tournament is the president of CBS Sports, and we're going to tell him that he's wrong about whether you or not you want big teams in the tournament. I'm going to roll with what he says over anybody else, and I okay. just think we like Cinderella's early, but when they go further, it gets to be a little bit less interesting. Now, with Loyola, what I find to be interesting here, there's been no flukiness about what they've done. They've gone out here and they beat teams. There were the close games, and then they had this one against Kansas State where they were the better team out there on the floor. But is this the best Cinderella there? An interesting comparison to George Mason. Because, yeah, this this team beat Tennessee, but then they wound up getting to play Kansas State in the Elite Eight round. That George Mason team had to beat a UConn squad in 2006. That was probably the best team in the tournament that year in order to get to the next round. So this has been a great run. I don't know how you necessarily compare it to a squad like that, though. How do you view it, Clinton Yates? I think that he's coming at this from the, at the wrong time, from the wrong angle. Look, they've got a nice little Final Four set up. You've got a couple of traditional powers. You've got Loyola that are in there as a double-digit seed with a non-basketball story to go with it. And Sister Jean, what more could you ask for? Overall, though, I just don't seem to understand why he has to give us all this information when people are already leery of what happens with the selection committee, what happens with referees, if you've got the president of the company that's airing it coming out and saying, actually, we need these other teams here. It makes it seem untoward in a way that makes me uncomfortable as a fan, even if I believe and understand what he's saying. Mm. That's interesting. Tim Kalish, how about you? I mean, Loyal is a really fun story, and they're great to watch. I, I love this team. They didn't even have to wait for a last-second shot for once when they blew <laughs> yeah, out right. Kansas State. Uh, but Bomani's right about George Mason. They had to beat not only Connecticut, but Michigan State in that run uh, when they were an 11th seed. And you also got Virginia Commonwealth. When they did it, they were a playing team. They had to win five games to get to the Final Four. So there's been teams that take tougher roads but still, you shouldn't be shouldn't be uh, doing the Odell Beckham on this like Sean McManus is. <laughs> okay, Bob Wright, how about you? Number one, I have a quiz for you guys. What's the highest rated elite game of the last fourteen years? Highest rated. Uh, uh, the answer is yesterday's game between Kansas and Duke. How about that? That's a fact. Number okay. two, in terms of historical uh, runs. We are approaching the 35th anniversary of the greatest of them all. Do not forget where North Carolina State came from in 1983. They were within less than a minute of losing in the first round of the ACC tournament, and it would have knocked them into the NIT. And then they went on that miraculous run thanks to the fouls that they, you know, the foul, foul, foul thing and all that. So that still, to me, is the greatest run. Okay, I mean, that, that's the greatest run, in, in your opinion, that's great, but you can't compare it. 
size of school, at least, or alumni. NC State no. is NC State. Loyal to Chicago is loyal to Chicago. And now who do they take stories. on? They I take agree. on B- Michigan. Big Michigan. Yeah. On a 13-game win streak. Is Michigan being overlooked, Linton? I think so, but I also, I just, in general, like the Michigan story, frankly, more than I like the Loyola story. Let's not forget what happened in the Louisville Championship game with Trey Burke, speaking of officiating, and that bad call. Beeline has been nothing but classy when it's come to what's going on in Louisville and how that program has reacted. I think them getting back to this and being back in the hunt for another title would be a great story that is getting overlooked. Well, we saw Michigan put up some points recently. We had not seen them be that good at scoring. This team that got here with defense fourth overall this year, according to Ken Pomeroy, in defensive efficiency. Most of the regular season, you know, they, they, they lost a couple Big East games, but they, they, were, they were clearly better than Xavier when they played them, uh, you know, during the season. And they've been great in this tournament, and they find different ways to do it. I think they're a slightly better version of Kansas than Kansas is, and that's what I think gives them the edge over everybody the rest of the way. Clinton, is it Villanova and everybody else now? Uh, Villanova, yeah, I think so. And I think it's really, they're the team that seems to be able to just blow anybody out. They just look like the best teams. Jay Williams, our colleague, tweeted, he said it's not even close from a talent standpoint just from him watching it. If so, that guy says something, I'm going to agree with him. And Jay Wright's done a great job. I mean, the guy just looks like he's always in control, which is something that has a lot of value at this point of the tournament. A lot of that has to do with the suit, though. But Monty Jones, how about you? Well, they're the only remaining team in the top 15 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. Now, this is a Final Four that is low on star power, and Villanova is the most complete team. I would say that they are the favorite, but I'm not sure there's anything called a prohibitive favorite in a single elimination tournament. And Bob Ryan? I've said to the beginning that if all 68 teams played an A game, Villanova would win. And they won yesterday with a C game. And by the way, someone has to give a props to the Wolverines, the only school with a team in both the Final Four and the Frozen Four. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll take that. This Villanova team has won their last eight games by double digits. We're going to take a break right here, though. A scoring adjustment is needed. Take a look at our tournament challenge. Tim Kalishaw is in the power seat, and he has Villanova, so... Oh, but yeah. if you're looking for everybody else on today's panel, Clinton, Bomani, I Bob, D and P, Bomani, you said you filled one out, so, the, out so we'll look for that one. Who'd you have in your uh, final game, by the way, Bomani? I don't remember who, but I Kentucky know Kentucky and UNC. Game. Let's take a break. Ryan, I don't know how else to say this, so I'll just say it. What is it, Linda? I think we should see other people. Are you breaking up with me on a roller coaster? Well, we do have a lot of fun. Maybe we should stay together. An emotional roller coaster? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. I just need a little me time. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Buy or sell. Grade 2 MCL strains can take six weeks to heal. Steve Kerr says there's no way Steph Curry will play in the first round of the playoffs, which start and end inside of three to four weeks. Round two starts in five weeks. Curry says he wants to get back as soon as possible. Tim Kalashow, buy or sell this being a postseason changing injury? Sell it for that. Now, if, it, if, it, if it's recurring in the postseason, obviously that changes things. But I don't see anybody, even in that jumbled West, who could be a seven seed, who could who could even still compete and, and get to six or seven games with Golden State without Yikes. Curry. I think it definitely changes things. Sometimes perceived weakness is just as good as actual weakness when it comes to the competitors that you're dealing with. But what bothers me is the situation between what Steve Kerr thinks is going to happen and Steph Curry thinks is going to happen. Are you guys going to be fighting in the playoffs as to who's going to be playing and who's not? That doesn't bode well, in my opinion. Omani Jones? Yeah, but Clinton, the fight you're talking about is a common one. The player wants to get back. A player is always going to want to get back. So, yeah, Curry's going to want to get back as soon as he can. But I think this is playoff altering, not playoff changing. And I say altering because Curry is going to come back in time to play in the playoffs. Yes, but we saw him on a bad wheel in 2016. And on a bad wheel in 2016, he couldn't break down Kevin Love off the dribble at the end of the game. That'll alter the playoffs. Okay, so you make a distinction between playoff altering and playoff changing. Bob, you can approach it either way. Altering, changing, is this something or not? Slightly altering, but I'm totally on the scamp school that says that. that no, slightly. They're, they're, they will beat anybody they play, play as a two. And without him, KD steps up. I guarantee you an average of 33 points a game okay. as long as it's, or, or more if it's necessary. I go to the altar with that. Buy or sell two. The New York Giants say no players untouchable. That they can trade or release anybody. 
Consider that. And NFL Network's Good Morning Football, Ian Rappaport, Rappaporting today. Odell Beckham is not going to set foot on the field without a new contract agreed to, whether the Giants or whether anyone else. Clinton, are we at something or nothing here? I think it's definitely something. Odell Beckham's in a tough situation here because of that off-field scenario. I don't like the way this bodes in terms of his down-the-line public, you know, sort of attitude and his ability to market himself, but... He's also the best player on the team by a mile, and you probably couldn't name one person who you could trade the guy for in the league, which means he's worth every dollar to the Giants. Oh, you can name a couple of draft picks, though, for the first Those are people, matters. they're picks. Let me ask you this. You can put a number on it. What chances the Giants trade Odell Beckham before the start of the season? 40. 40% chance. Wow. Oh. Monty Jones, uh, by your face, I'm, I'm thinking you don't think that's the case. You must be crazy. You're telling me the organization that let Lars Taylor get one drug test away from expulsion from the league is going to trade Odell Beckham behind some pictures? They ain't trade him behind no pictures. Was, and now, yeah. If they get like some Herschel Walker type haul, then yeah, maybe they'll do this. But no, Odell Beckham's going to be playing for them because look at what happened with Eli Manning the last three years when Odell Beckham did not play. What you have, though, is a whole lot of people who love the idea of humbling Odell Beckham. So you have to say stuff like he's not untouchable and everything like that. But when you know he's damn well, he's the best player they had in 30 years. They ain't letting him go unless they Stupid. Play the same game that Yates just did. He put it 40%. What's your odds maker? Chances they trade him, Bomani? Zero. Okay, the old squadouche. Bob Ryan, how about you? My percentage is a single digit at the most. He's easier to play for them, or he's not playing at all this year. And let him sit out, because as long as the Giants don't have him hurting him from somebody else, they're going to they're gonna sit on there and, you know, keep the free faith that way. Tim Gallagher? I'll go 4%, not 40%. We don't get big, prolonged holdouts uh, into the season like we used to get 20, 30 years ago in the NFL. All we get is a lot of sniping and nastiness in the spring that usually leads to nothing. The, the Giants are nothing without Odell Beckham Jr., and they know it, and they'll find a way to sign him. Move on. Buy or sell three. Roll tape. Down the stretch there, the end of the game, the final seconds, 11 seconds left on the clock. Do you think that the game came down to the final seconds of the game? I'm asking you, though, why that decision in the final seconds of the game? The game was over. You didn't think your guys could get back in it, put them on the line you if they but, miss those shots? I mean, but 15 seconds, uh, what, what, what were we down? Put them on the line, they miss a few shots. Leonard Hamilton has released an apology. Dana Jacobson has released an ex- explanation. Bomani, how'd you see all that play out? So it was a bad look for Leonard Hamilton. It was a reasonable question for Danny Jacobson to ask, but the disconnect comes in, and all of us are asking that question. And Leonard Hamilton is like, what are you talking about? The game was over. Like, literally the only person in the world who didn't think that was crazy was the person who was getting the question, and then he didn't know what to do because he thought the question was crazy. Bob Ryan? In a season where we saw a miraculous comeback with 0.9 seconds to go, uh, he'd be very naive, he being Leonard Hamilton, not to expect to get a question when you're down four with ten and, and things can happen. So I'm very surprised that he didn't get it. Tim Gallagher. Florida State fans had just watched their team get back into the game because Michigan has all these guys who can't shoot free throws. And you've seen all the graphics and the weird form, dribbling the ball out here. What's that all about? And, and all of a sudden with 11 seconds to go, that's useless? Didn't make any sense. Lynn Yates. Leonard Hamilton is too respectful.